one guy wrote it, but all these few letters represent it. Because we all talk about have to. I have to go to the grocery store, have to, have to pay the bills. And this guy was like, I just stopped saying it. I, I mean, I, you know, we, we get to go to a grocery store because we live in a country that has grocery stores and we get to pay bills because we have a roof over our head. And um, I, I never like to say this in a way that sounds preachy, but if you hear it from someone who's been through hell, and we do all the time, it's hard to argue with. It's like so much is perspective and get to is a very handy tool that we use all the time. Um, and I recommend at least thinking about it. Good evening and welcome to your library. I'm David Leonard, president of the Boston Public Library and your host and moderator for our public conversation series. Uh, tonight we are gathered once again in person um, in the Abbey Room here in the Central Library at Copley Square. And we are also joined by our online audience via Zoom. Uh, tonight is the fourth of our Lowell Lecture Series events this season and is again produced in collaboration with the GBH Forum Network and the Boston Public Library Programs and Audiovisual Team, um, as well as being sponsored by the Lowell Institute. And now I would like to just briefly introduce our guest and get on to our conversation. Uh, when John and his brother Bert started what is now about a $150 million company uh, in 94, they had famously $78 in their pocket, living out of a van, sold t-shirts on the streets of Boston. And it's been over 25 years since that first t-shirt, uh, but John and Bert champion the same mission to spread the power of optimism. And certainly that's something our world needs a lot of right now. On their journey, they've been inspired by a vibrant community of resilient optimists, people from all backgrounds who identify deeply with the brand and who constantly demonstrate the depth and meaning behind the three simple words, life is good. This is a local story. This is a story of business success and a philosophy of life. And who says that you can't do what you love and be successful? How do we use this philosophy when confronted by terrible tragedy or the challenges that life's, life brings us? John, welcome to the program and welcome to the library. Thanks so much, David. Um, Thanks every, everyone for coming. Yeah. yeah. Um, Good to see you. We, we like to get to know our guests a little bit in terms of their personal biography and story. So I'm wondering, could you tell us a little bit about what life was, was like growing up and sure. your family? Yeah, um, we grew up in, I'm the youngest of six, and you mentioned Bert, he and I are in business together. Youngest of six, grew up in Needham, Mass. Um, say lower middle class, even though that town has evolved over time. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see, our dad was a World War II vet who worked in a machine shop. He actually went to high school what was, I guess, like a block from here. It was called uh, Mechanic Arts High School. And, um, and he was a precise craftsman and uh, really encouraged us to get outdoors, which I'm grateful for in retrospect. Um, but it was a chaotic house. And by the time Bert and I were, you know, three, four, five, uh, the, our parents were totally overloaded and, and we're, we're in, in some ways on our, on our own, and um, I mean, there's a lot I could share. We're very lucky that, that it was a tight-knit family, but I think the things that jump out looking back are um, our dad, both our parents were in a car accident when we were about eight and five, mm -hmm. and um, our mom fortunately was wearing a seatbelt, and she just broke her shoulder and it healed okay. But our dad was not, and um, he ended up losing the use of his right arm. And for a guy that was such an avid outdoorsman and a precise craftsman, the combo of trying to feed eight people on a slim salary and not being able to do the things he used to be able to do um, led to tremendous frustration and a lot of yelling in the house at our mom, at us. You know, we only realized when we were older, he was just frustrated by the whole situation. But it, it created a pretty tense atmosphere on a lot of days in our house. 
It was a, it was a um, packed little house. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when we look back, it's never as black as white as like one parent is the, the villain, one is the hero. But, but we, um, in shorthand, when we look back, our mother found a way to access joy and humor and fun. And she told a lot of stories. She sang songs. She drew pictures. She got us drawing pictures. Um, we were always on the, on the kitchen floor drawing stuff. And she had Johnny Cash or Willie Nelson or something playing. And um, she, we, we really weren't the kind of family that could go to Disneyland, but we felt like she taught us how to travel in our minds. And you know, we, we could draw anything we wanted. And the stories that she shared you know, made us laugh. And at the dinner table, she had this tradition of looking around at each of us and saying, tell me something good that happened today. Hmm. And it sounds so simple, but um, yeah, that's, that's Joan there. And um, we, we easily could have, and maybe before she started doing that, could have been complaining about a hard assignment or a kid that was bothering us at school or a teacher that was tough. But because of Joan, we, you know, one or two of her kids would share something funny or absurd or, you know, uh, just, just something positive after that prompt. And it created momentum, and, and suddenly we were like connecting with each other and laughing. And it wasn't for years later that we realized, looking back, like she made this decision every day to change the energy in the house. And our dad was a complex man, so he, like I said, he gave us a lot of things. He loved us. He, he, the outdoors really jumps out, and also like trying to do a job right and get the details right. Um, there's many things he gave us. In fact, when I'm sitting in the BPL, I have to say this guy was uh, obsessed with books. And um, later in life, when funds were even more tight, he was still, we were joking that he was having an affair with two people named Barnes and Noble. Like he'd get a, <laughs> he'd get, we'd get a package. I'm like, mom, can we afford the, you know, he's like, she, she's like, it doesn't make sense. But he had a very, uh, at first, neat and then chaotic collection of books, but he was endlessly curious about FDR and Churchill, about airplanes, which he worked on radar equipment in the war, um, semiconductors. I never knew what those were and still don't have a good grasp of that, but he was always like riffing on this stuff, and even until his 90s, he lived till he was 93, super curious. So I'm really grateful for that. And um, so, but anyway, staying in, in childhood like that, Joan um, really showed us how you can choose optimism, choose to focus on good things. She, she didn't, she wasn't like completely ignoring the fact that there was tension, that there were bills to pay, that we ran out of money sometimes, that every two weeks my dad would get paid, but she found a way to access, you know, music, humor, and I think that was a, the number one ingredient in our childhood that like helped us view the world positively. And you've dedicated the book to her also. Absolutely, yeah. She's the first powerful optimist in our life and to us the most important one. And our, I mean, not, not to jump too much ahead, but we have a nonprofit called Lives Good Kids Foundation and it's all about if children can have one positive, loving, caring adult in their life, their trajectory can be so different, even if their background is very difficult. And um, so we focus a lot on training teachers, counselors, oncologists, those people that can have that impact. And sometimes it is not the parent, maybe it's a coach or a teacher, um, but we're all about trying to help those people who are heroes in the field every day to retain their own openness and playfulness and optimism. And we're, we've been growing that for decades now, but we still have so much work to do, but, but it feels like we're impacting a lot of kids, particularly in the US, through that program. So it sounds like um, the, the, the core of the optimism and that value comes from, from your mom. Absolutely. But, but the, the curi I'm intrigued that the curiosity and the, the intrigue and, and so on seems to come from your father. Yeah, well. I mean, they stuck together. And, and yeah. it, was, it was, especially when we were teens, it was very tense and we weren't sure if that was going to happen and they they found a way and then 
later, I, I, don't, I don't know if I should stay chronological, but like <laughs> when we all got out of the house and you know, there was less stress financially and we ended up knocking down the old house and, and building a new house and our dad could relax a little bit and then he went from grizzly bear to teddy bear. Like he was, um, by the time my girlfriend, now wife, met him and like the last like few decades of their lives, they were like, it was, I don't know, newlywed is, is maybe an exaggeration, but like they really were a loving couple and he loved having people over the house. Whereas when we were kids, I think he was so frustrated by the, the financial strain and the state of the house, which was falling apart and just had piles of stuff everywhere that he didn't really love people coming to the house. Well, it's, t it's tough when you want to do so much and yet there are barriers um, that, you know, either through, through loss of a limb or just economic circumstances get in the, get in the way. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, as we were chatting beforehand, that, that phrase early in the book, it, like life is, life is no. not easy, life is not perfect, but, but life is good. Yeah. So maybe let's go with that phrase for a little bit and see, uh, Absolutely. See, where, see where we get to. I mean, yeah, we could look back at our own childhood, but then what really awakened my brother and I to the, how much depth people could get for these three syllables mm -hmm. is we couldn't have predicted this, but after we started getting a little momentum with our business, mm -hmm. Um, and selling life is good, we started getting letters from people and we got some that simply said like, thanks for helping me celebrate the mountains or music or road trips. But we got almost equally letters from people going through really difficult things saying like, your hat helped me stay positive during chemo or we all wore life is good to the funeral service for my brother, he, he really lived with a positive energy and it, it was incredibly moving, but my brother and I didn't know what to do with them. We were trying to figure out how to run a business, so we would just throw them in a drawer. And then it took us years to realize we just need to share these. And that was about the time we created a website and we started posting them online. And then we started hearing from people saying, oh my God, I feel less alone. You know, my sister's going through this. And so we call those letters fuel and we have so many like thousands, and uh, these days they might be email or, or occasionally a paper letter or with photos, even video sometimes. And people really feel an emotional connection to the brand because of the other stories they read online on our site. And they, these people, these fuel stories, they're the ones who helped us understand the depth uh, of, of the message. And they also, to a person, it seems like when you go through something really heavy and difficult, you emerge with an elevated sense of gratitude. And at this point, I'm in my 50s, so I, I've been through those moments and stretches, and uh, it, it's very true. You come out of it appreciating every sandwich, every conversation, um, and hopefully you retain that even in the good times. And uh, I, I think we do a decent job of that, but, but it's really the community that keeps inspiring us and, and we read a letter. We'll read it aloud. Oh, that's, sorry, I, I didn't know that picture was up. Um, that is an early one from um, probably around 2000. Alex and Nick, they're twin brothers. One was legally blind and one uh, has one leg. They were born early and they wrote this one page letter, but it was, there was so much wisdom in it. And it was just like, you know, people ask us what we love to do because we wear the shirts with all this stuff we love, but it's really just laughing together. And um, we, we were like 10 years old and they already had things kind of figured out, it seemed like. So we would read that to our employees and then um, we've kept in contact with them. We got to meet them uh, in person, um, probably when they're about 12 years later. And driving there, my brother and I were like, there's no way they can live up to like that letter. It was just so perfect. And when we got there, they really still were, they were about 17, but I didn't do my math well, sorry. <laughs> no one checked me on that. They were 10, and then I guess it was just seven years later, we met them in Chicago. And, uh, and they were saying how they used humor to, to 
respond to bullying because of, especially Alex's leg, they put up a lot of bullying. And I was like, what do, you, what do you mean? Like, can you give an example? And they said, well, we just make up incredible stories about you know, what happened to his leg. And they were like shark stories. And, <laughs> and, and I was like, how? And, and he said, well, our favorite one, our mom doesn't like it. But, uh, and their mom was sitting right there. I was like, and she's rolling her eyes. She said, well, we would tell people that our mom grew up on this remote island of cannibals, and she ate Alex's <laughs> leg. <laughs> And I said, how long do you mess with people? And they're like, as long as we can, like every time. <laughs> but uh, they really do get the gratitude thing. They haven't lost any of that. They have an incredible perspective. Like I was saying, I think anyone who's dealt with heavy stuff and found a way through, it's like a new confidence that you can navigate anything. Um, and a lot of it is up here. And, um, and this elevated gratitude, which I think is very central. Optimism is number one for us, but we've got these 10 values we call life is good superpowers. And wow, somebody's really smart back there. Um, <laughs> thank you. And we feel like optimism enables us to access all of these superpowers. And not, it's not like bullet speed or Herculean strength. These, these are superpowers we can all access. Sometimes it's really difficult to do that. But we think optimism is the key to doing that. And it's, uh, it's not about ignoring bad stuff. We're realists um, and we're rational optimists. It's really about what you choose to focus more energy on. So you acknowledge the tough stuff. You say, how do I solve that? Or this kind of sucks right now and I, and I don't know what to do about it. But the, the key is focusing more energy on, okay, there actually might be an opportunity here within the puzzle, within the challenge, um, and what am I gonna do about it? How, how can I make this a bit better? Um, and you try to apply that, I think, to other people who inevitably are going through heavy stuff, friends, family members, and I, I, I'm always relearning that too. It's not about when your friend's struggling with something immediately saying, it could be worse, everything's fine. You know, that's not particularly helpful, but acknowledging it, being there with the person, and then maybe gently trying to help that friend toward a perspective of gratitude and seeing the bigger picture. Yeah, I'm, I'm struck that, I mean, he, we as humans- David, how, how, are you okay with the length of these answers? Sure. Okay, Yeah. just checking. <laughs> Feel free to just be I'll like... I'll interrupt if, uh, if, we, if we get there. You can but, use the hand if okay. you want. All right. <laughs> no, it's your story. I'm just here to help you tell it. Um, the, the, we as humans often have a great capacity for denial when faced with, with, with challenge. And what I'm struck by in reading the book and also in just listening to you tonight and looking at some of these superpowers is that's the one thing we really shouldn't do based upon the philosophy is we've got to accept no matter how difficult what's in front of us is and then by getting through it maybe we, we get to a better place yeah you're right i mean i was talking about doing that for your friend but yes for yourself mm -hmm. you gotta acknowledge that and i have conversations with my wife where i i think i my transition is maybe too fast sometimes and maybe okay. you guys could relate but like yeah. I, I maybe it's because what and by the way my brother bert is here and my wife um, Jess is here mm -hmm. and they're obviously a big part of this story yep. <laughs> but I, maybe it's related to the childhood I described but like mm -hmm. I tend to move quickly in my mind toward well it could be worse and um, this could you know end up serving this purpose what and when you've got someone like you know, really close in your life, sometimes you gotta realize, or, or kids mm -hmm. that need to just maybe be sad or angry for a bit or a day or, or an hour or something. Mm -hmm. And then you rally as a team. Um, I, I, I think for Bert and I, it worked so well. Mm -hmm. And we used humor so much mm -hmm. in a tense atmosphere growing up. We were in bunk beds together. And uh, by the way, can you show that picture? Because I, <laughs> I enjoy this. So that's Bird up top, that's me, and it's a tiny room. We, we got, somebody got us Sports Illustrated from the dump. They didn't need them dump, and we'd rip them up and tape them on the wall. And um, the reason I like this picture, for two reasons, um, 
Number one, it's a great disclaimer for me because I'm a bit of a space shot, so I might lose my train of thought in the middle of one of my long answers. But if you look close, oh, this is a radiator with lead paint chips. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm inhaling that on a daily basis. And uh, it may lead to, let's see. <laughs> um, actually, we almost never, Bert, we never had like storm windows, right? So like in the winter, we didn't really open the windows. So what I'm saying is it's my disclaimer. Um, <laughs> We inhaled a lot of lead paint, and the second reason I like it is our parents were way ahead of this whole green movement. You know, never mind 100% cotton organic sheets. How about no sheets at all? <laughs> no sheets, you don't have to do laundry, conserve water. So Joan and the bear, Joan and Al were the geniuses behind that. Um, but anyway, I was saying because the Bert and I found things that worked, like humor and like looking on, focusing more energy on positive things and opportunity instead of more on the obstacle. I think it really uh, clicked into the point where it's our number one response. And I don't, I don't find that to be a problem. I, I find it really helpful. Um, I'm just realizing as life evolves that when you're and it talking may, right. to others, you gotta, you got to understand the pace. That, so, and it may be that some, for one person, it's one superpower that stands out. For someone else, it might be humor. Um, yeah. And yeah. Can we just change tracks a little bit yep. and talk about the, the starting of the company? Sure. What, what came first? The, the, this concept? Or, no, we're going to start a company together? Or how, how, did, how did that uh, happen? Well, I'll, I would say Bert and I were really tight growing up in the bunk beds. Then he was four years ahead of me in high school. So we barely like waved to each other in high school. And then, and then we did this cross country road trip. Uh, we were both living out west, California and Colorado. And we decided to meet up. And um, I was in my junior year of college out there on exchange. And we did this, this really fun road trip with very little money. Um, sleeping in the truck and stuff. And that was the first time we talked about after having pretty magical weeks, like sleeping in the mountains of Wyoming or like beach, Southern Cal and stuff. We talked about what could we do together and eventually we landed on t-shirts and we, we viewed that as like an accessible way to make art, you know, because the idea of like painting and trying to get art in a gallery was very intimidating. So what if, we just did some sketches and tried to put them on shirts. This is actually in uh, South Boston at a parade in about 91, 92. And um, so we did start, first we went to some local colleges in the dorms, and then we'd go down to like Faneuil Hall and pop out a little card table. Mm -hmm. And occasionally we'd get scattered by the police because we didn't have the right permit. Um, we go to Harvard Square and do the same thing. And Boston College and all local schools, we'd door to door. Part of us didn't want to leave college. We were, I was just finishing school, <laughs> Bert was a few years out. But we were running through dorms and knocking on every door trying to sell shirt. And um, very little success. We were wildly unsuccessful um, those years. But, but it, was, it was fun, it was energizing, especially when someone bought something and you saw people wearing your artwork is like that. That kind of propelled us forward. And um, when we very, the very first year we started, we were living at, back at our parents' house. So, and substitute teaching as well on some days in the high school. Um, but to, to jump ahead a little bit, uh, do you have the one of the, the drawing? Yeah, so we, Bert and I had a bunch of drawings and we had rented an apartment and we, we started doing these road trips. There's, there's a lot more detail that I'm missing, but we, we, bought, we went to a auction with our brother, Ed, who knew a lot about used cars, and he helped us buy a, um, old, uh, an old van. And um, we ripped out the back seats and we, so we could pile T-shirts in there and we could sleep on, back of the, on, on top of the shirts. And so the, the van became, we called it the Enterprise because it was 
Uh, first of all, it was based on Star Trek, like to go where no T-shirt guys had gone before. <laughs> of course. And, and we, uh, we realized the, it really was our enterprise because it, the money, any money we made, we just put under the seat. Our inventory, our whole inventory was in this van. Um, that was our office. I mean, we didn't have an office. So, um, and we do these road trips for weeks and just sleep in the back of the van and go down the East Coast selling in dorms. And again, not much success, but kind of fun at times. Other times we're getting scattered like rats out of the dorm because we, we're not a student there or we don't have the permit. So we're trying to find a way. Meanwhile, our friends are getting real jobs and starting to have real relationships. So it's kind of pathetic when we see them. We're out on the street in the rain trying to sell a t-shirt like Christmas season. And they're like, John or Bert? Like, how are you doing, man? But, and, uh, but then it clicks. Uh, well, yeah, they run, get a pizza slice, and David's like, yeah, come on, get to the part. <laughs> so anyway, finally we had this drawing. We, we had some friends over when we got back from a trip. And we had a keg party, and we, we put our drawings on the wall. And this one girl wrote, uh, this guy's got life figured out next to this drawing. Other people wrote a lot of comments around this. And the next morning when we looked at the wall, we're like, whoa, there's, there's something about this guy. So we put him on a shirt in 1994. We took it to a street fair in um, Central Square, Cambridge. And that changed our life because we had 48 shirts. We put them out. We've done a few of these fairs. We usually sold like a dozen shirts. In the first hour of the fair, 48 of those shirts were gone. And it was people from all walks of life. And it was very exciting and scary at the same time because we had no idea how to run a business, but we knew we had something. And then it was just like, OK, what do we do now? We decided to knock on retailers' doors like we did in the dorms. A lot of rejection, but finally somebody tried it. And you know, a lot of small business stories after that, but really, that was a big breakthrough. And then it was just making mistakes and learning. And mm -hmm. the momentum of, and, and the power of those three words really carried us. Yeah. And so, and today, how, how many stores, how many employees? Uh, we've got about 350 employees. Yeah. And um, the stores are independently owned. Um, there's about 40 of those. Right. Um, yeah, so from just knocking on a few doors and a fair here and there to, to that. It, uh, how, how does that feel now to realize that that's started with here, this was the, this was the clincher, huh. and, now, uh, and now today? Uh, I think the growing the team and the community has been the most exciting thing and the learnings from them. And I remember, like, because it was just me and Bert for several years, and then first employee was a girl that moved in in the apartment above us, and we asked her to work for us at night and then then it was like will you quit your job please and she was good at like better than us at like five different things which and and that was a great learning early on because if it's if a business is your baby it's really hard to let go of any part of it so the fact that Kerry crushed us in so many skills was like oh my god so then it wasn't so hard to say yeah maybe someone else should like head up sales or Sure. Obviously, things like IT are very obvious because we have no, no strength in those areas. I know that would shock you guys, but uh, but I'm also I'm imagining. I mean, so so the the brand, the concept, the the feelings, the vibe is so essential to the product um, that building the team, people have to you have to find people who bought into that, right? Yeah, I mean, certainly on the creative side, and those were the hardest hires: the artists, writers, later. That's that's a very nuanced thing, but the ones I alluded to, you know, IT, that's not a hard thing. It's just like, who is great at this job because we don't know anything about it. Or um, operations, same thing. Like we did it for years and in, in made a little warehouse out of the back of an 18-wheeler and, you know, printed, shipped, all that stuff. But then you find a pro and it's like, oh my God, they're, they're five times better than us. And plug that into every aspect of the business. <laughs> And um, it allows you to focus more energy where you, where you have a strength. And uh, certainly I've been aware of the growth of many small businesses. And 
you know, what company culture is like? I mean, even deciding that at some point you do actually have a company culture yeah. is kind of an enlightening point. Yeah. Um, I, uh, and, and going from like two or three to 350, there are interesting points along yeah. those, those growth I'm curious, Bert, how does it feel? This feels so good as a younger brother. Bert can't even access a microphone. So it's just... <laughs> we, we can solve that. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, um, well, I, I'm just thinking of Bert and I and our personalities, and it, it organically grew. I mean, we were hiring buddies sure. and cousins and, like, and, and it was like, and friends, yeah, and, and the fact that we prioritized having a conversation with people instead of starting a conversation, sorry, I didn't say that well, but like later when we sit down with a retailer, it was city sports here, it was, uh, you know, yeah. mom and pop shops on the beach or in the mountains. We would not sit down and just be like, how many units can you buy? And like, what's the projection? That's just not in our nature. So we would talk about the weekend, we'd have some laughs, we'd connect with the person personally. And we found, looking back, that is not that, is not that common and it was refreshing and it's very effective because you wanna build relationships. I know that sounds cliche, but and it's way more fun to do business that way. So same thing with our employees. You asked about the culture. Yeah. We really believe in like having laughs during the day, occasionally throwing a ball around or frisbee or something. And the conversations we like to think when we're our best selves, it's a little bit like improv comedy where you're yes anding somebody's idea and building on that instead of like territorial and just wanna get your own idea across. Um, and I think that, that, that affected the people we hired sure. and the people that really rose up and thrived have some of that in them and maybe, not maybe, some of them brought so much, thing, th a lot of things that we don't have uh, in spades, like the, sort of the, the rigor and the discipline of, you know, let's say the finance department or something where you need that right. more and they would balance our personalities and our strengths so that ultimately you have a team. Did, did, we, did it ever turn out the other way where this is a really great person, a really great company, but God, that wasn't a great business fit? Oh yeah, 100%. <laughs> I mean, right. 25 plus years, so we've got a story every which way. Yeah. 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 Um, and today, is the, the spirit the same? Has it evolved? Uh, I, mean, I think you, you've, I, got, you've, got, you've got a theory of it now, which probably wasn't as, as clear early on. You say a theory a of theory, it? A theory, like these 10 super values. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, I think the fuel was a big breakthrough. The depth yeah. and realizing the impact we could have mm -hmm. on people. And, uh, and then the same, at the same time, we had a friend that had started a small nonprofit in the Boston area. Mm -hmm. And he's, we ended up doing like fundraisers for him a lot. Yeah. and his nonprofit, and then we ended up merging and that became the Life is Good Kids Foundation. Yeah. So um, those two things, I think, the fuel, these stories, wow, the, in, the average person could really be lifted by messages of optimism and gratitude and courage. And then we are very aware that we're lucky to have grown up with some food on the table and love in our lives. So how do we help people that struggle for those things. And we think for us, focusing on young kids who've dealt, who are dealing with um, uh, trauma at a young age, that could be violence, yep. that could be physical challenges, um, then, uh, or, or poverty, focusing that on their lives and how we can maybe affect that trajectory feels like the most impactful thing. So, sorry, you asked about the spirit. Um, it is very much alive. I feel like we've gotten smarter about the hiring. And, and uh, um, so, and, and I think another key component is we haven't gone public, we haven't sold the business, and people ask about that stuff a lot. But we have observed, without judgment, because it depends on your goals, exactly. but we've, we've observed a lot of companies that lose their focus on the mission. Our mission is to spread the power of optimism. And we feel like we do that in a few different ways with the business and the nonprofit. 
But I, we have seen companies and leaders, once they go public, it's hard to stay, put a lot of energy into the mission when the yeah. shareholders are just like, well, you just become make answerable more. to different um, yeah, masters. Yeah, just, or... just make me more this quarter, and we don't want to ever have that mentality. So Yeah, I'm intrigued by, by you saying that the, it's, it's first about the mission to spread optimism, and almost that the business is secondary? Yes, I mean, we feel like growing the business helps that because we're reaching more people and our community keeps growing and we hope more people are lifted by the, our, our messages on social media, the stories we share. Yeah, that's, that's a bit of a mix of some of the people that send pictures in. Um, and uh, it could be that a lot of people say just putting on the shirt myself reminds me like, to focus on the gratitude part. And I realize the people around me might need a little lift. So that's the simplest form. And then there's these other ways we feel like, we, we know that if somebody gets to, um, chooses to read the book, that, that goes a little bit deeper, or they watch a video on our website or something of one of these heroes, maybe that goes a little deeper, um, but they're all positives in our book. And I feel like the world is getting slammed with negative news. And we realize these things are real. Um, there's so many major problems that humanity's facing. But we think the right way to approach that is to acknowledge them, think about how we can help with them, mm. and also amplify the good things that are happening. And we feel like the news found a formula many decades ago where if you scare people, then they feel like they have to watch the news. And I, I'm a big believer in sh encouraging people to be selective about what you take in. You know, and we all have maybe a news source or two or three that we go to, but also the other kind of media that, you know, if you're listening to a podcast or reading a book or uh, watching a movie, what are you choosing to take in? Uh, I love that old, Native American parable. I don't know if you ever heard of the one about the good wolf, but the hi, Poppy, neighbor. Um, the uh, the young young boy asks his grandfather, you know, um, something about good. Uh, the, sorry, the grandfather says there's there's good wolves and bad wolves in the world. You know, I'm not going to tell you that the world's all good wolves. And the kid says, well, what? which one wins, Grandpa? And he said, whichever one you feed. And I think it's, that says a lot. And I, I apply that very much to media. And like that doesn't mean just listen to good news, but listen to a trusted source for the news, good and bad. But again, that those other things, which ones lift you, inspire you, encourage you, and which ones leave you feeling hopeless and discouraged? and really be intentional about what you take in. And you can apply the same to the people that you interact with. I know in some cases we don't have a choice, family or coworkers, but the people you spend, choose to spend time with, are they on board with you and trying to live a positive life and, and feel good? Yeah. And if not, you know, try, to, try to make some decisions that can help you in here and here. Yeah. Um, I've got one or two more questions before we start taking some audience questions, both from our in-person audience and, and online. So please be, be thinking of something you might want to ask, John. Um, we, we designed this series in part as a response to the challenges, some of which are global over the last couple of years. Um, so I do want to talk at least about one or two of the, the, yeah. the I, think, I think there are about at least five major, major threats to humanity right now. Um, COVID has been tough on everyone uh, these last two years. H how, did, how did your company fare? Um, thanks for asking. I, my mind goes to, well, first of all, we, we found a way through and we evolved and actually changed the, the nature of our mm. business model mm. as a result. And um, it's something my brother was really leading a push to be a more, more focused on the end consumer. Mm -hmm. And we were sort of making ba taking baby steps toward doing that and having more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the end consumer as opposed to the retail buyer sure. 
who usually at that time was like, I, I need to predict in right now they would be saying, summer 2023, which designs do you think will be most relevant? And we'd try to guess and we'd make a catalog, but that is becoming a business model that uh, it needs updating, <laughs> I'll just say that. So um, when the pandemic hit, first of all, I wanna give a shout out to our leadership team because they helped me and Bert see that completely shutting down our business wasn't the best thing. Um, we, if you own a business and you've got employees and you believe their health is threatened, it seemed like the obvious thing to do. We need to just shut down completely. Mm -hmm. And particularly our team up in New Hampshire where we have shipping, receiving, and where all our, our product is, they said, you know, just so you know what's gonna happen is all these people are going to have to pick up a job uh, with Uber, with uh, UPS. Mm -hmm. If you guys can create an environment that is safe where we can go to work and just work in the warehouse and we can get tested every day, mm -hmm. much better. And that took several very tense days of trying to figure out what the best thing forward, way forward was. But really credit the leadership team with guiding us through that and, sure. and shining a light and talking to our team, you know, one-on-one -on -one and saying like, would this really benefit you? you know, and we ended up staying open and the focus became which, which messages might be relevant. You know, we, we had things like stay calm, stay cool, stay home, mm -hmm. um, or wash your paws and it would have like our dog character with, you know, it, it, we, we thought like which things could actually help people and they want to share with their neighbors. So um, we stayed open and again, Bert was, had great vision on this and he was pushing like, okay, now is the time where we need to, because stores did not exist, like suddenly, at least half of our stores were not open at all. We were facing the possibility of going bankrupt or laying off a huge part of our team or speed up this thing we've been talking about and, and the model, the shift in our business model. And um, we did the latter and got some momentum on some of those graphics and then started making packages quicker for the end consumer. People. They want, fr when they want to look at fresh stuff, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. often. So that was not a, not a year from now in right. the summer of 23, right? Exactly. Yeah. And you're obviously way more aware of what's on people's minds. So um, this became more of our model and we picked up momentum and ended up having like a strong end to 2020 and uh, started viewing and building our business mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, be, because of the length of my answers, I get lost on what the question was, but... <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I was at, like, how did you do yeah, yeah, COVID, we, which we, I think that's a, that's a great business yes. uh, answer. I, I think the spirit of your message in your company perhaps also has something to say to people who are buying the product. And, and it seems Absolutely. like Absolutely. And the same, we talk a lot about we all have challenges, obstacles. Can you find an opportunity within the obstacle? And that was one that our leaders helped point out and, um, and we found mm -hmm. in, in that moment, knowing that people were, yeah, I'll just stop there. <laughs> <laughs> I, so uh, one, of, one of the values in the book, I, I think is start, community building. You, you talk about it, the art of the gather. Um, this strikes me that this choice of those messages actually was about building community during COVID as well. Absolutely. Um, so tell us more about the community aspect of, yeah, of, I of, mean, the, of the mission. I, we, we've had some fun events. We had these, uh, the, the pumpkin festival, there, there you go, is one. That's on Boston Common. And the world record before that was 27,000, 28,000 lit jack-o'-lanterns, Guinness Book World Records, and we said, okay, we've done fundraising. We, Bert and I used to help host like basketball tournaments, and we'd raise a few thousand bucks and, for that first nonprofit. And, um, and then as we got momentum and we realized, you know, people will really rally around a cause, especially if you don't make it, it doesn't have to be a grueling running 26 miles, like, what if we just come up with something, some reason to gather outdoors 
And so we said, let's try to break this record. And we started in 04, and we did like 16,000 pumpkins, and then we did 20,000 pumpkins. We were asking the public, like the Boston community, to bring your own pumpkins, carve them, we'll help you light them, we're gonna set up the scaffolding. And finally, our third try in 2006, that's where this picture's from, um, we broke the record with 30,128 lit jack-o'-lanterns. And more importantly, we raised a quarter of a million dollars for kids mm -hmm. facing life-threatening challenges at the time. And that really confirmed, like, people, yes, they loved telling their family that one on the seventh level is my <laughs> pumpkin. But they also loved pointing, saying, I was a small part of something really big and positive that happened today. Yeah. So that led to a lot more events. We did big music events down in Canton with uh, Jack Johnson. This is Michael Franti, Dave Matthews. Sarah Bareilles, and you know, we didn't really know what we we're doing music event-wise, but the artists knew that our aim was true, that our cause was real. Every penny from these events that we raised went to the Kids Foundation, so they would they would agree to join these this ragtag event, and uh, it really was a physical manifestation of our values. We we had physical play going on, music, um, just just connecting so I appreciate you guys doing this um, by the way you guys um, free for all that phrase gets me every time I walk by it's yeah, just and and then reading the history um, of someone centuries ago committing to this this needs to be accessible to everybody and the fact that you expanded to 26 branches yeah, 25 today yeah I was I'm driving through JP yesterday yeah. and I'm like there it is, they're making computers accessible, they're making information, books, and we humans, especially in 2022, we desperately need to see people in 3D and feel connected. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope this, you know, that we still, you know, we keep going in this direction so that we can do that and hug and <laughs> be together because I, I am very grateful for the technology that has allowed us to Zoom with each other, but there's no, there's no replacing this kind of thing. Um, yeah, I was joking we should start bringing our Zoom backgrounds with us in person so we can uh, recognize uh, what, it, right. what it's like. But uh, right. uh, no, I think we, we, we would agree that uh, gathering and space, uh, having public space that's free is essential to, yeah. to just being the social creatures that and, we are. And leaning into the positives of digital and the internet, right. we have seen a lot of people aren't that mobile or they they want to be really connected to our stories or messages. Obviously, we make it easier and easier to share stories and hear stories that, that might lift people. Well, I am going to take some questions. Oh, uh, yeah, cool. We, we could probably chat for, for two hours, but uh, let's give a few other people a chance to, to get a question in. Just raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll bring the microphone to you. Andrew is walking it about. We will go over here first, if we can, and then come back to you in the front. And then we'll take a third question from online. Well, first, thanks for coming. That was a great presentation. And I haven't read the book, so I apologize if you've covered some of it. But one question I have is, what do you think the best advice you got is during this journey that helped the two of you go along? Because you must have gotten some outside advice from either some mentors, uh, you know, other than you two figuring out yourselves and going along and having the friends say Jake is great and the message is good. Yeah. Just curious, what, kind, what do you think was some really good advice you got as you went along? Thanks. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, I will say this and then try to come up with a, sp a specific one, but like openness as a superpower is underrated. And if I think back to our journey, we didn't come up with the answer of like that guy, put him on a shirt, it was a friend, and it was other people that wrote notes. And then when we actually started selling to retailers, it wasn't us that said, we should make this, this, and this. Retailers said, hey, does that guy ride a bike? Does that guy eat ice cream? We're like, ah, I guess give us a couple hours and he will, you know? And we, we draw it. And then the biggest one of all was uh, these fuel stories, because we, we probably wouldn't have realized, oh my gosh, people are going through hell can be lifted by a hat or a t-shirt or, or a, one story, like reading a, 
a paragraph. Um, so openness, these huge, those were sort of three, they weren't like sound bites, they're more just like the idea that you don't have to be the genius that figures it out. We've never been business geniuses. Bert, agreed? Yeah. <laughs> Bert's on the fence. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> they must be brothers, right? <laughs> um, let's see. I mean, there's specific ones about like, this sounds so obvious, but um, um, the fact that we needed to get a rep out on the road, like we just didn't know to hire somebody. And they were like, you need someone every day, like knocking on a door, different stores. But there's tons of those. Um, I'm trying to think of, there, there was so many times where a, an older, more knowledgeable person was like, do you have, what do you have on books for next year? And we like, what book? And they'd be like, <laughs> like order, what's in the order bank? Like wh what's an order bank? And it was like, well, we just, he's like, how do you predict, like how do you, decide how much inventory to build. He's like, well, it just seems like we're doubling every year, so we just make double. And he's like, That's, that is not a smart. <laughs> you know, like, um, so, yeah, I, I hope the first part was helpful. Yes, he's giving me a smile, so. But you're also, you're, you're describing you moving from being reactive to being more proactive. In, yeah, in, in you're ways, right. right. You're right. Would and you, um, no. planning was not part of our growing up or the early five, 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 seven years of our business. So that part was helpful to hear from those because we would have imploded if we didn't start planning a little bit better. Great. We had a question in front. We can, we can take the online question and then come back to, to you. Jana, thank you. John, thank you. Uh, Estelle writes in and wonders what happened with the other kids in your family. Oh, uh, I am happy to say we're very tight and um, they're all in the New England area. Two, our two sisters live in their hometown, Needham, and the other two guys uh, are around. And um, both, both of the brothers are also involved with our business in different roles. And one of our sisters was at one point and uh, started having kids and jumped from that job. Um, we, we always laugh, our sister, you know the, I kind of hinted that our dad was a perfectionist, but he, he, I said he's precise. You've done more than hint now. And right? our, our sister Eileen worked at the very beginning of our online business, and she found that occasionally the logo on the hat would be like, uh, you know, an eighth of an inch askew or something. So we'd go down, and she was dangling the hat, just trying to like view it before she packed one in a box, and we were just like. Eileen, like, I, we got to find a way where it's not like a, like a specimen every time you look at it. But I loved it, and she made every, time, every one of those first packages really well, well presented. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, she, she jumped to another like a bookkeeping, accounting type of job. And, but the, the most important thing is we're, there's a 10-year gap between us and we love getting together. Thanksgiving's our best holiday, and I know I'm very lucky saying that, but um, the family's very tight, and I think that's a credit to Joan and Al. Okay. We'll take the next question from in front. Thank you. I don't have a question, I just have a comment. I just wanna say how grateful I am that I came tonight to hear you. It's so wonderful to hear your story, and it's just wonderful that you got to tear down the house and build a new house for your mother and father. It's just wonderful. Oh. So thank you so much. When I saw you, I'm like, oh my God, you, my nephew looks just like you. He's 30 and he's has all these struggles in life and I, he tries to have optimism. I'm gonna have him Zoom this um, program so that it will help him. Oh. So thank you so much. Thank I'm you really so much. Glad, I'm so glad I came tonight, so thank you. Bert, tell her what Joan's favorite word was with a Boston accent. She just said it. Yeah. Wonderful. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Do we have oh, thanks so much. That was really nice. Do we have another question in the room or online? We'll take an online question. Would you mind commenting on um, how your life changed um, becoming millionaires, perhaps? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it's so funny, like Bert and I used to say, like, I, I don't know, other than getting a, a bike, like we didn't know what to do. And um, so I, in all seriousness, I think buying homes was a huge deal for us. And for us to move to this neighborhood felt ridiculous. Like, um, and, and my friend's parents were like laughing, like Bert and John are living in the back bay, you know? So I, I, I never lose gratitude for that. That's, and, and I still live in the same place, and Bert does too, that we bought a long time ago um, when we had some success. And um, um, otherwise, I would say the ability to travel is a huge thing that I really appreciate. And um, th fortunately, I married a woman who's game to sleep on a floor and, and you know, camp anywhere. But the fact that we, we have that freedom to do that with three kids, um, I'm grateful for that. But it really isn't, we're not m much for like collecting shiny stuff. So it's, it's really the friendships and all that, but uh, I, I really am being sincere. What else? The, the home, I think, was the big breakthrough. Like having a place of our own was huge. Well, and I, th I think, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you started your own foundation in combination with uh, this other friend, colleague that, that you yeah. grew up with. So, so that's another way in which you're using that, your That's your a little resources. more close to the heart. Like just having the ability to impact lives um, is, that's the dream. And I think we didn't know the words, but I think since we were teenagers, our mission has been to spread the power of optimism. So, and, and that's really all comes from Joan. So the fact that we get to do that um, and by the way, get to is a phrase we got from our community and it's so powerful. This one guy wrote it, but all these few letters represent it because we all talk about have to. I have to go to the grocery store, have to, have to pay the bills. And this guy was like, I just stopped saying it. I, I mean, I, you know, we, we get to go to a grocery store because we live in a country that has grocery stores and we get to pay bills because we have a roof over our head. and. Um, I, I never like to say this in a way that sounds preachy, but if you hear it from someone who's been through hell, and we do all the time, it's hard to argue with. It's like so much is perspective, and get to is a very handy tool that we use all the time. Um, and I recommend at least thinking about it. Yeah. Um, I, I have two questions to end with if, if there aren't any others in, in the. Oh, there's one more. Uh, we'll we'll uh, take that, and then I'll, I'll wrap with my two. Oh, one. Yeah, thank you. It's just a very simple question. Um, do you remember the exact moment or memory when you decided to name the company Life is Good? <laughs> so funny you asked that. Could everyone hear that question? Yeah, um, because Bert and I really don't know. Like we, we uh, and it, depending on our mood, we want to be like, ah, that was totally me. Like I. <laughs> I came back from this conversation, and I, I do remember it a certain way, and Bert remembers it different, so it's just like, it's, I don't know, I, we like to point to Joan, but I, I wish I knew exactly, but it's, uh, we know those, the year was 94, and that drawing in people's comments kind of, it was almost like we distilled all those comments that were like, this guy's got life figured out around the face, and said, they're all saying life is good, like they're not saying it's perfect or easy, but that's where it came from. Yeah. Thank you. There, there's a um, striving in today's modern society for this thing called work-life balance. Um, I'm just wondering if you have a take on, on if that's attainable, is that the wrong way to think about it? Um, it, it sounds I think like it is the wrong way to think okay. about it. I, I think it, it sounds like they're at war with each other. And I, I like work-life harmony is one way to think about it. But I think if you bring good energy to work, it might have something to do with like good things that are happening at, at home mm -hmm. and vice versa. If you believe in the work you're doing, mm -hmm. then you're probably more energized when you come back to family, um, spouse, mate of any kind so like I, I yeah I don't I, I don't it, it almost feels seems like it's a war going on and it's all about the hours and stuff and it, if you can find things you believe in then really leaning into that doesn't seem like a painful thing that's combating your life right. Right. thank you um, we are right at time um, I'm gonna ask John if you have some 
closing thoughts or takeaway? You know, I think uh, there's been a lot of great questions and interest in, 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 in the topics. So, yeah. um, um, closing thoughts? I think, I mean, I hope some of those superpowers you'll remember, but the get to is something that people tend to remember because it's so simple. And I think that could be really helpful. And uh, I, you know what just popped into my head is I've got a few friends going through really difficult stuff and my buddy who's, uh, she's going to have eight hour surgery, double mastectomy tomorrow in New York. And she was telling me on the phone that she read this article. She has an awesome uh, attitude that some, someone wrote, if we could all walk around with sandwich boards that said what we're going through, maybe people would be a little bit more kind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think just remembering that everyone's going through something mm -hmm. might be just an everyday little struggle or it might be something really heavy, but all of us keeping that in mind um, makes us uh, make a little effort to connect with people with their eyes and maybe with a smile. And it's really nice to see faces in 3D. Right, uh, the last few months and tonight. So thanks for coming out, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just, just before we close the program, um, and you know, there will be a book signing uh, for a few minutes for those of you who'd like to, to participate, just a note about some upcoming programs. Um, our next uh, program in this series uh, will be a conversation with Eddie Glau Jr. on June 8th on race and democracy today, um, which will be a, a timely topic as we approach the Juneteenth holiday. And then our Drucker lecture, actually the week before on June 4th, uh, will be awarded to local chef and celebrity Barbara Lynch. Um, so uh, please keep those in mind. Please keep an eye on our website for other programs and events. Um, until our next time together, please be safe and be well. And now, please join me in a final thank you to our wonderful guest tonight, John Jacobs. <laughs>